The following program is produced by the Tech Talk Radio Network. This is Alice Cooper, the original techno tard, and you're listening to Tech Talk Radio. Welcome to another episode of Tech Talk Radio. I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeird. And I'm back. <laughs> Look, it's slick. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of interesting, though, because... You know, I thought about it. We really have to talk about what took place with the uh, the big Apple Worldwide Developers Conference. It was funny, uh, Sean. Slick reached out to me. Slick was raving about it. I think, like, Slick's point was what Apple did was different than what we have seen in the past from other, you know, other people that have decided, let's go into the world of, of augmented reality, virtual reality, with the goggles, the whole bit. I know, Sean, did you get a chance to see the demonstration at all? Uh, I mean, I watched what they showed on the, you know, the keynote and stuff, right? I was sitting, I, I, I hung, I was at work and I told people, don't bother me. Yeah. I shut myself into one of our control rooms and anytime somebody came in, I said, get out. I'm watching, I'm watching <laughs> this. They're like, I need help. I get out. I'll help you when it's over. <laughs> now, and uh, no, it was really cool. I was, you know, I knew they were going to announce their ar vr device right we didn't know what the name was mm-hmm. and they the name for it is apple vision which is a i think it's probably one of the coolest names they've come up with yeah. in any of their products yeah apple vision it's dope right and i was actually facetiming with a friend during the conference talk listening and talking about this stuff and it's just we were just our what it's weird it looks weird and if it functions the way that they show it functioning with just you know, like no controllers, eye tracking, all of this immersion stuff, right? Yep. It's going to be really cool. Slick, explain like what, what you thought about it that made you go, oh, wow. Because you, you watched the first hour, and then you said the second hour was even more amazing. Yeah, I watched the whole thing. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot I want to talk about. We could be here for for the night. However, let's the, the thing that jumped out of me, because we're going to talk about the Vision Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I've never owned a MacBook. I've always, I've always wanted one to try it out. I've used Macs. I've used the Mac OS. I've repaired it and all that. And it's kind of neat. Um, but I've never really put it to use to see how it functions and performs for me. Yeah. And I'm a form, a particular form guy. I mean, like the MacBook Air, when it first came out, I mean, then some of the, some of the other MacBooks are too small. The screens are too small. I, you know, I'm in there like this. Mm-hmm. working and i can't do that yeah sean I sean it. had the same issues too well yeah. but Kay- caitlin has we caitlin got a macbook air back in 2013 right it was the first release of the macbook air had the intel i5 in it you know 256 meg or, or gig of ra- of uh, storage you know the whole mm-hmm. bit right and it's just really small the yeah thir- the 13 inch screen on those is tiny and they had a 10 inch one also right wow they, it just was so small I didn't know why they would do it, but I, you know they, they sold them, so I guess it worked. You know, people loved them, and then I, I assume it's because of the Mac experience. Mm-hmm. That's what I think, not because it was you know. So well, the the airs the airs sold really well because they were the first slimmest slimmest laptop you could get on the market. It slid into a purse, a backpack, you name it. Right, the battery life was incredible for them. They didn't have the brightest display, so if you were working outside at all, they were garbage, right? Yeah. So it, but it was a very lightweight, compact laptop, but it was also the first to get rid of most of the peripherals, right? right. Most of the USB, most of the Thunderbolt, most of the actual uh, LAN, LAN port, RJ45 ports, right? So you had the people that hated it, but you have Apple who was five, six years ahead of the wireless generation, right? Yeah. And you look back at everything Apple's done and they've always been five, six years ahead of innovation. And so what does that look like now for the MacBook Airs? Is like the MacBook Air was five years ahead of six years ahead of where it is now. And now look where it's at. And I think that's where Slick's going with, with the, with the air they announced during the show. Yes, I am. And just a reminder, Sean, my birthday is coming up. So uh, the MacBook Air 15, I am in. I'm, I, I mean, if, if I really want one of these, I did check on the pricing. I think it starts at like 1299 or something like that. I don't know what the Ram is on it, yeah. but because of, because of uh, the way I work and I'm not normal, I'm not like everybody else. I mean, I need a lot, 
to because I have opened up way too many browsers with way too many windows with way too many tabs and way too many applications running in the background. That is me. So, you know, uh, if I, if I can't have what I want on one platform, I use three computers at the same time. Why? When I worked for Microsoft, we had three computers at our desk at the same time for that reason. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I had in front of me, I had my main computer. And off to the right, then I had what would be considered my computer. Yeah. So Microsoft said, you know, set this up however you want, do whatever you want. Now over to my left, I had what we called the break me, the beta box. Uh -huh. So I could do literally anything to it or, or mimic, you know, somebody calls in, I got a problem. Well, I would damage, I could damage my beta machine and then just wipe the drive and start over. Right, right. You know, that's what it was there for, to mimic the problem somebody else was having. You know, so, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering, though, okay, so at twelve ninety nine dollars as a price point, right? Um, when you talk to people that maybe are not that ingrained in, say they use a PC, they've never gone over to Mac to experience what the Mac OS can do. That's different, right? And some people will say, well, Windows 11 is basically looks just like the Mac and blah, 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 right? But the problem is... How do you convince a consumer that is in that position, that has been a PC user for so many years, to say, look at this $1299 MacBook that, that you could use, and it does this. When they look and they see, oh, look, this Asus or this Dell machine for $499 or a Chromebook even, how do you convince so, them that it's going to work? I'm going to ask one question, right? I'm going to ask them if they have an iPhone or an Android. Hmm. If they have an iPhone, I'm going to say get a MacBook because it is going to be a seamless integration for everything you're doing on your iPhone. It's going to look just like your iPhone. It's going to act just like your iPhone. You're going to be able to hand off apps between the two. Like if you if you're all synced up with iCloud, it's it's a it is become a seamless solution with the with the introduction of the M1 the, the Apple Silicon, the M1 chip and now the M2 chips. And we'll talk about the chips too because I'm going to blow your mind with some specs on some of the the MacBook Pro, the Mac Pro stuff they announced too, right? It's a it's it's a user experience, right? If you're familiar with your iPhone, you're going to be familiar with your Mac. It's that it, that's it. That, yeah, there may be some oh I can use text edit instead of Notepad, or you know if you're a little bit more of a savvy user, it's terminal instead of the command line, right? It's right. like there are some nuances that are different. But if you're just using it to browse the web and do your social media and do a little bit of photo editing, the experience is the same between that and a PC. I Can, agree with him. The yeah. integration is just great. Yeah, I agree with him. I, I'm kind of wondering if some of the the you know the there are some good groups of Mac groups that are out here, whether they be power users or first time users, if somebody thinking about getting a Mac should go visit some of these Mac groups that have their you know meetings maybe once a month. Or, go to an, go to an Apple store. Put your hands on it. Apple store or even a, like, even a Best Buy that has, you know, the, their little Apple area there. I found that those reps are actually pretty knowledge, knowledgeable. Well, because they're hired by Apple has in Best Buy, it's, it's a pseudo Apple store, right? They are actually Apple representatives in Best Buys. Mm -hmm. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, as I always say, ask about the return policy. Yeah. Now, why, why would you do that? Because you know some people do, are not happy. They'll take they'll take it and uh, they I don't like it. You know I, after you give it, I say a week and a half because I, I will assume the return policy is as short as two weeks, but it could be longer. I'm yeah, saying. I had somebody so, not long ago ask me that they were going to finally, you know, go in and buy a uh, buy a Mac, you know, desktop mm -hmm. Mac that they really wanted to have, and uh, they said, "What should they do with their PC?" And I said, "Keep it, put it to the side." Because then you're going to be able to go back and forth until you're fully ingrained in that OS. It's like, you know, taking somebody and putting them in, you know, a Porsche or a Ferrari and saying, go ahead and drive it or a car with a stick shift. There's, there's certain things you need to learn before you make that 100 degree switch. I think the idea of going to it, we have a, you know, uh, an Apple store at La Cantata. This will give them the opportunity to get, like you said, hands on and ask the okay. questions. Yeah, here's kind of one of the points I wanted to make before I forget about it about the MacBook Air uh, 15. I, if if I can get one, I'm gonna I'm gonna ex I'm gonna go for the the 24 gigabyte RAM unit only because mm. I want to really put it through its paces. I want to open up, like I said, multiple windows and run all and see if I can choke it. I can choke computers. I've choked them. Yeah, I'm still choking them. 
<laughs> I want to see what, with this new integration of the Mac OS and their M2 chips. I want to see. Yeah. Now, all right. Speaking of M2, now uh, I know Sean, you've looked at some of the specs, and we talked about M2 the first time we heard about it uh, last year, or even the year before. It might have been. I don't. I don't remember, but. You were even then excited about what kind of performance that these M2 chips are going to give. Yeah, so they announced the M2 Ultra chip, right? So for 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 those of you who are listening, I work in a broadcast. I'm, I'm a broadcast engineer. I work in broadcasting, like, and this this is why I'm excited, right? They finally announced for the Mac Pros PCI Lane support, PCI Express card support. Wow! So your Mac Pros. Can now put in AJA cards, Black Magic cards, you name it, Matrox cards, anything that's going to be able to do IO, video, audio, IO at PCI 4. So that's incredible, right? Yeah. So that's a huge step. But the Mac 2, the M2 Ultra, right? Up to 24 cores of CPU. Wow. 76, 76 core GPU. It's they're they're claiming it's forty times faster than the uh, the M1, uh, four times faster than the Intel based IMAX, six times faster than the, uh, yeah, six times faster than that, ten gig Ethernet. Uh, it's got Thunderbolt four. Uh, you can do up to one hundred ninety two gigs of memory, of <laughs> RAM. Wow! Oh my gosh! And they're saying that their memory internally will do eight hundred gigabits worth of bandwidth between the memory and uh, it's just it crazy it crazy so i'm gonna the stat that, that stuck out to me the most in this in this was they were saying that the new mac studios not oh. the mac pro the mac pro is probably they didn't have a whole lot of stats on the mac pro yet yeah so this is the mac studio could take in 24 4k streams so it could play back in real time, 24 4K streams, while also simultaneously transcoding them to Apple ProRes with oh zero Lord. frame drops. Or, or whatever they said. They said some sort of really incredible you know, feat of engineering, right? But that's crazy. So 24 for... 4K streams wow. playing while also transcoding those 24 streams and storing that as ProRes, Apple ProRes. So for the for the broadcast professional or media, whether it be you know local streaming media, whether it be production uh, like a production house, this would be a solution that they would want to go to if they want to take less time sitting in front of the computer doing rendering, streaming, broadcasting, record it, the whole bit. Yeah, App, Apple's just it, it. The last handful of updates for the M1 chips have just. Intel and AMD have got to pick it up if they want to keep competing. Yeah, because if you're a production house, you're you're buying up as much M2 Ultras as you can buy right now. Slick, you you like that? Yeah, I do. I do. I was just, uh, you know I was just wondering after they were r- rattling off the specs to uh, to Sean while he was watching the uh, uh, the keynote. You know, when wh- at what point did you faint and then somebody picked you up off the floor? You- <laughs> uh, my my jaw was on the floor for most of it. Right, it's just like. Uh, it's when one of my other engineers was in there while we were watching this part. And you said, did they say 24 streams? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And then they said, while also transcoding to ProRes. And it's well, like, it just was like, you just kind of shake your head and go, that doesn't seem possible. Right. Because no. ten, you think about it, right. 10 years ago, most Apple machines couldn't natively support H.264. Right. When Final Cut 10 came out, when they launched Final Cut 10, or what became Final Cut Pro, mm-hmm. right? They did not natively support MP4, yeah, or anything except ProRes, right? So it's like it's crazy to think in that amount of time, that jump. Now we're here, right? It's yeah. just crazy how fast well, we're going. Let's let's talk about the technology that that also got the most press. Now, mm-hmm. what we're talking about, probably, yeah, there were a lot of the tech publications. We're covering it. Uh, I know David David Pogue, I think, was covering some of it, but it seemed to be like even David and some of the major the other major journalists were more into the you know Apple Vision because that's honestly what the public is going to see and say, "Wow, I get it!" Just by seeing what it does. So it's different from Oculus, whereas Oculus provides 
the experience all within the goggle. Everything is in the goggle. Uh, or you've seen if you've used any of the other devices where you have your smartphone, you know, in inside something you're wearing on your head. That's what you're looking at. Apple Vision has pulled that block, and now they're giving you your reality mixed with this virtual reality that Apple or augmented reality that Apple is able to do somewhat akin to being, and I hate to compare it to the, but remember Pokemon go, you're going down the street. Oh, you know, yeah, think yeah. about it. It's probably a bad example, but <laughs> you're going down the street. There's your little squiggle and you, 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 you are interacting with it that way. It's that same kind of idea that you're in your reality, but you've got this augmented reality that's in front of you. Uh, Tim Cook, I think would did the demonstration where he was showing you know, he could he could turn his head to the right and there was a screen that would be the icons. So you're not looking, you know, moving a mouse over a to a on a monitor there in the air is your icons. And he puts his hand up in the air and, you know, he pushes the icon virtually that he wants and it will start the program on the screen in the middle. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. But will people spend that money for this technology. Yeah, I, I kind of slunk back into my chair because I was like this. I was all I was on the edge of my seat, on the edge of my seat, and I was like, all right, this is gonna be like two grand. Right. Right. I was like, this that's gonna be it's gonna be the price point. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be affordable. Four thousand dollars, thirty nine ninety nine. Yeah. Four grand is a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Do you know how many drones I could buy with that much money? <laughs> Well, you can't buy one entire Inspire. Let's face it. I can't buy the Inspire, right? But I could buy four Mavic Pros. Yeah, or you could put the down payment on the Inspire. That would be good. Yeah, it's just I just I get it, right? It's Apple, and they have to be. It they're light years ahead of the other tech, right? It, just from what I saw, right? It feels yeah. like they are five years, six years ahead of you know the Hollow Vision and the um, the. Well, the other headsets, you know, the like Oculus, the, yeah, the Meta, you know, Meta. the Meta one, the Meta, but it, not that much, not that price point. Yeah, slick. Right? Would this be something you you would find use for? Absolutely. He's just mad about the money. This gentleman, <laughs> welcome to the world of spatial computing. This is the stuff that was in the movies. We are here now, and this is what it costs to enter this world. We'll start at thirty five hundred. Yeah, we'll just start this. Everything starts to where right. we can't afford it. <laughs> well, yeah, think about think about computers back in the, in the nineties. You know, you you go to look at a a PC with a core, maybe a tenth of the power that we get today, and you were going to spend thirty nine hundred dollars. Yeah, I yeah, I just think it's a it's yeah, you're right. It's everything has a price to be at the bleeding edge, right? But if you look at what people people have been specking out PC rigs, like mm -hmm. full immersion VR rigs. And they're just barely touching the 4K mark on some of that. Yeah. Right. So I think you're you're just you're gonna get the people that want to spend the money and be at the bleeding edge. I just if they made it a little bit more affordable, they could pull in such a larger market share. But well, but. Uh, yeah, but they're they're gonna make enough money off thirty five hundred dollars. They're gonna make enough to get started. Come on. What? And then they'll lower the price and they come up with a different model for us poor people. I had a listener, uh, Mark, who called here at the station. Uh, I was on that day and was asking me about it and uh, wanted to know, though, if they were to drop that money on the, the Apple Vision, would they also have to own a Mac? No. So it's no. all self-contained, all Spatial within Spatial computing, yep. yep. Right. It runs Vision OS. Now, back going back to what we said earlier, right? All of this, this whole ecosystem, right? So if you have a Mac or an iPad, it's going to be great. Because one thing, one of the coolest features that I think was part of it was you have your Mac running. You just say, all right, I want my desktop in VR. And you just say, give me my desktop. And you just look over, and there's your desktop. And it runs everything off of your computer. So your computer is still doing all the processing and all that stuff. But you're seeing the virtually rendered desktop within your AR environment. Yeah, the only, the only downside to this, and I was telling Gloria about that, and I, sh I showed her the demo, uh, is that, you know, she works in the health health industry and has to meet people, and, you know, they come and give that info. If she had something like that and they were utilizing that, 
they'd be pointing up in the air. Like you would see people. Oh. That's all they're doing. <laughs> Just pointing everywhere, you know, trying to get access to all the the screens and the prompts and the whole bit. I mean, it would it would be kind of cool to see. Yeah, it's going to be interesting seeing somebody else use it without context. Yeah, where it's like, is there going to be a way where you can see what they're seeing internally? Like, you know, if mm-hmm. I have my headset plugged into my computer, I can still output what my headset is seeing to a monitor, so other people can watch what I'm seeing. But that's an idea, yeah. Is that I don't think that's part of this, but it's just no, you know. But it's weird because if I walk in the room, and you're wearing the goggles, or the you know the vision, it's smart enough to know that you're in the room and makes it so you can see my eyes. Yeah, that is that's so trippy. It's and yeah, you would know somebody's there. It's not like you're a closed experience like the the you know Meta headsets uh, where you're you don't know if somebody's behind you, which is kind of scary. In this case, you. are fully aware of what's going on in the room, which again, that could also be a real popular selling point for people who want to try it. And I know slick is one of those. I want to use it. I don't want to just try it. I want to use it. I want to be able to not have to sit here and talk to you and I could, we could do this and I could walk to the kitchen and start making sandwiches while we're doing the broadcast. I mean, you know, I don't have to be right here in front of the computer. We could tell more mustard, more mayo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. We got to take a quick break coming up. We're going to talk with representatives from Netgear. Netgear has been making some great products. We recently looked at the Mural 2, which is a digital photo frame uh, and was great, but they got so many other great products. And I don't know if you guys know this, but June is Internet Safety Month. So it's kind of a a great month to find out some, some products that they have that can help keep you safe while you're using your routers, your modems, and other technology in the home. Also, if you're going to go stay in a hotel why you want to take one of their devices with you. So we'll find out about that. And then we're going to talk about irrigation, digital technology to help you irrigate your yards. That's all coming up with more of Tech Talk Radio. I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeird. And I am Slick. Find us on the radio at techtalkradio.com. And on the web too. <laughs> find us on the, did I say find us on the radio? Yes. I did. I did. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> And now back to Tech Talk Radio. You know, I get really excited when we see new products and we see products that help us when it comes to uh, getting online and our online security. And one of the companies that has been at the forefront for that is Netgear. And with us on the line is our senior product line manager with Netgear, Shalini Sengupta. Welcome to Tech Talk Radio. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little history about the company. I think everybody's heard about it, but where did Netgear get its start, Shalini? So it's actually a 25 plus year company. It's almost getting on to its third decade now. Uh, it's based in Santa Clara. It's a, it's an American company and it's always been in networking solutions and it's always been in uh, both the home and the business uh, networking solutions. So what it's most known for, I think, are its uh, Orbi line of mesh products, it's Nighthawk routers, it's cable modems, so the entire networking solution. And when it started out, it was, uh, as you said, you know, it was known for some of its innovation that it brought to its space. And now we're also getting into all the security services and other services around uh, some of these products, essentially. This month is Internet Safety Month. What does that mean for a company like Netgear? I think it's about bringing awareness uh, around safety to the community, to um, to the educators, to essentially everybody um, and anybody who's using the internet. We just released a report, uh, you know, we were working with our partner, Bitdefender, and we, we're seeing that, you know, on average, a household today has around 46 connected devices. Wow. 46 connected devices. Yeah. And most of these are like IOD devices, et cetera. So it's really about, you know, bringing awareness about the threats and dangers uh, as you use all these products online. And as some of this threat landscape also changes, essentially. Yeah, we hear all the time about uh, ransomware attacks. And we hear about uh, attacks even just on, on regular, you know, mom and pop, small business or even homeowners that just you know, just get online. They think they're just checking email and there's so many different things that can happen, but we have to be concerned too, not only with the companies and, you know, our parents, but our children, our children get online. And uh, do you have any tips? I know that, you know, people are always asking me, Hey, how do I, you know, how do I keep 
my kids safe when they're getting online at home? I think some of it is basic education, right? I mean, just having that conversation with your child about what, where to go and where not to, um, what links to click is a is an important one. I mean, uh, so you you could have very, you could have malicious uh, URLs that you click on, which you know put uh, essentially uh, agents that can deposit malware on your devices. So it's really about a little bit of it is around education. Um, you know, you always also want to take basic precautions like, um, you know, ensure that you have some kind of security software um, and you have some kind of parental control. So parental controls, for example, would allow you to filter out URLs that are not, uh, you know, child appropriate, etc. So some of those uh, kind of basic tools um, you know, having those uh, also allows you that second layer kind of of, uh, of precaution. There is a misconception, isn't there, when it comes to people who say, you know, I just use my computer for email. Uh, that's all I do. Or maybe, you know, I'll go on to Etsy or I'll go on to one of the many sites out there, maybe buy stuff. But and they think that they're they're safe, that they, they think they don't need this extra layer of protection, but really that is a misconception because even with just getting an email, that can open up our systems to malware and, and other types of problems we may run into. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the, I think, most common forms of of threat, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, of, of basically, uh, you know, people kind of uh, hacking into your uh, device because some of the most common things are obviously spam as well. You know, just the amount of spam you get and slows down your device, etc., so you want to be careful of that. You want to be careful of all the phishing links. I was talking about uh, some examples. You know, I was just reading an article that, you, you know, Google used to have this verified or just had introduced this verified check mark. Right. Right. And, um, you know, very recently, basically what happened is somebody managed to spoof it essentially or hack it. So uh, it was meant to validate or verify your identity. And so now you have a situation where that's being spoofed. So you don't know that those people are actually who they say they are. Right. Yep. So, so you have, uh, I think emails are targeted most often, you know, and it's one of the, uh, like, as I said, one of the most common forms of threat, uh, uh, th yeah. sources of threat rather. Actually, uh, the, just the other day, and I've been in this, I've been doing this for over 30 years. The other day I, I got an email in from, on my Xfinity account from Xfinity saying, you know, your bill's past due. And I'm thinking, huh? No, it shouldn't be past due. It's not, you know, not due till the 8th. And I remember I clicked to see the email and I didn't click any links. But then I thought, wait, Andy, what are you doing? You, you know, you don't do that. Don't click on anything in an email because that opens you up. Now, we have some listeners that may be listening that say, well, you know, I love Netgear. I've got Netgear equipment, but they may have bought it about 12 years ago. 15 years ago, there have been new vulnerabilities. There have been, of course, strides in, in getting our DOCSIS 3, getting that a lot faster. Is it going to benefit the, the average user to actually look at some of the products that are available now to maybe upgrade or enhance their internet connected devices? Yeah, I mean, all your, whether it's the device or the router, I think, you know, having regular updates. So the problem with some of these old devices is they don't get all the security updates, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, they might not even be fully updated in terms of their operating systems. Uh, so, you know, they're prone to vulnerabilities uh, and prone to essentially being hacked. Uh, routers, uh, you know, we constantly deliver firmware updates, right, on our routers, for example. Uh, making sure you're updated to the latest is really important. But if it's really that old, like 12 plus years old, sometimes it doesn't even get these updates. They're not even compatible with a lot of the, you know, newer kind of releases. So I think it's really important to kind of... Um, either maintain and totally overhaul your system or keep upgrading, essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the other issue is a lot of these, uh, as, as you know, kind of you progress, as the newer releases have a lot of these enhanced security features. For example, built-in VPN, um, you know, so you don't have access to all of that as or better firewalls. You mm -hmm. don't have access to all of that if you don't have uh, essentially the latest security product. I talked to somebody recently that uh, was paying for, you know, high speed cable access and they were using an old modem and they didn't realize that they were capped out with that old modem. Uh, you need yeah. to upgrade that modem, which is what I did. And I got myself a Netgear modem and 
I love it. Uh, suddenly, I saw my speeds going from the 200 to 300 all the way up to almost a, a gigabit because that's what I was paying for. Yeah, absolutely. I talked about the security aspect of it, but exactly. I mean, performance is a huge issue as well, right? You're not going to optimize what you pay for on those older equipment. So it's really, uh, you know, worth looking at and upgrade periodically. Now, uh, I know that uh, some people have asked us to, you know, they may have a, a deal with their cable company or even in some cases, DSL provider. Um, when it comes to that equipment, you you pay a rental on it. Uh, and I had a, a director at the TV station just ask me. He's got DSL, uh, and I had him run a speed test, and it was <laughs> yikes! It was horrible. It was horrid. Um, but he wanted to know. Um, he wanted to get out of paying for that rental for from the from the provider, uh, and wanted to know what's the best way to go. And I said, well, you could get your own modem. You can get your own router. In many cases. It's just a matter of checking with the company. Is that something wise to do for for people if they really want to control their own situation? So it's not just like if you're, you're talking about the security aspects of this, um, you know, it's not just the security of the router. It's the security of everything that's connected to that device, right? It can be a point of um, essentially a source of uh, getting hacked. And so when you look at all the IoT devices, for example, on your on in your home network, those are most vulnerable to be uh, attacked. And if you're just uh, you know kind of protecting your router, you're not really protecting all those additional devices, right? So having something uh, that uh, you know you're purchasing on retail um, oftentimes gives you that added security, uh, where you are not just protecting your router, but everything that's connecting to it, right? You're mm -hmm. uh, kind of blocking out any kind of sources for um, vulnerabilities. Um, uh, you know, so for example, the Netgear routers come with this uh, subscription service called Armor, which allows you kind of that level of security. Um, also, you know, you uh, basically you get maybe you get some of the latest technology uh, because a lot of these companies are, you know, just focused. They're experts at, you know, what they do, which is the networking solution. You know, it's it's um, that's that's essentially what they focus on. And uh, you just have a wider option. You know, one size sometimes doesn't fit all homes. You know, mm -hmm. like mesh systems, for example, if you have larger homes, um, you know, um, where you are looking for a wider coverage, uh, you know, in, in those cases, you know, you want kind of something uh, which is which gives you a little more of that, uh, net, uh, that network coverage. You know, there are other things I could talk about, like who has your data? Like, mm. you know, do you, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, uh, are those, uh, you know, ISPs, do they have visibility in all your data? Are you comfortable with that? You know, Net Netgear, for example, does not collect user data. No. Um, you know, customer support, you know, there are other kind of, you know, th uh, kind of factors to think through um, as users kind of decide what solution is the best for them. And Netgear has a, a wide range of products, doesn't it? I mean, for somebody that maybe lives in a small home that has uh, maybe a PC connected or a Mac or maybe even two that are connected, but wants to have this to be able to go throughout this smaller home, they have products for that. But if then they have this big expansive mansion, like I don't have, uh, <laughs> then they could, then they could also use this, this mesh system, which is pretty amazing. And we're seeing more and more about this and getting faster throughput, but some people don't understand how mesh really kind of, kind of works. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, so the mesh systems essentially have satellites, uh, which, uh, you know, allow you to kind of get, uh, coverage, better coverages, uh, coverage in those rooms that are really far out from your main uh, kind of router uh, versus, you know, something like our Nighthawk set of products, which is all about speed and performance, um, and but doesn't have that kind of mesh uh, coverage. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, but yeah, Netgear kind of goes across both uh, types of products and types of networking solutions. But the Nighthawk looks so amazing. I mean, it really does. I mean, it's it sits there and it looks cool. When you think of some of our devices we've had over the years, yeah, you know, it looks like a box. This one looks pretty, pretty stand out. Now, it, there's also a product that's called the Nighthawk M6 Pro. Is this something that you would take with you if you were traveling? Maybe you're going to stay in a hotel, you want to be connected, and there's always kind of little security reminders when it comes to that. The Nighthawk uh, M6 Pro, essentially, 
So you want to have secure Wi-Fi wherever you go, right? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, you want that reliable Wi-Fi as well. Um, and so, um, and then you want those higher speeds compared to a typical Wi-Fi. And those are all the reasons why you would take some, you would connect to something like an M6 Pro. It allows you to simultaneously connect to, um, you know, uh, various uh, devices and uh, is password protected, is encrypted. Um, it's more convenient from that perspective. Uh, so you definitely want to take something like this mobile hotspot. Um, it's better than, you know, just having using your phone as a hotspot, mm-hmm. um, you know, because of all the convenience I talked about. And, you know, sometimes you also get those unwanted uh, ads when you start connecting uh, to some of these public Wi-Fi's. Um, so all reasons to kind of have your own kind of mobile hotspot, um, so- something like an M6 Pro. When it comes to, you know, Internet Security Month here, uh, we talk about protecting the, the home network and you, you touched upon Armor. How does that work? Yeah, so Armor is essentially built into your uh, all your OB and Nighthawk uh, products. So mm-hmm. there's an agent that's uh, on your router. So each time you're connecting any device connected to that router and that router itself is essentially protected. So all, um, you know, uh, all the traffic is filtered Um, And we ensure that there is and we flag any malware, any kinds of threats. Um, You'll get an instant notification saying we have detected it and we've blocked it. So it's not just at that router level, but it's all the devices, you know, that you uh, that are connecting to it, whether it's your smart TV. You know, the same report I was referencing earlier was talking about how smart TVs and uh, you know, some of these IoT devices are the largest sources of vulnerabilities, uh, mm-hmm. vulnerabilities being essentially backdoors that uh, hackers can en- can essentially yeah. hack and, you know, um, infiltrate into your network. So it's really important not just to protect, uh, you know, your PC or your laptop, but everything that's connected. And that's what Armour does. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also got, so assume, you, uh, you know, if you're taking your device and you're outside your house, um, it's got an antivirus, uh, software that you can download. So you can continue to stay protected, even though you're outside your house. Um, it also has VPN. It had some added, uh, kind of benefits, um, and features that like anti-theft protection, all of that, um, that you can utilize. And this is for unlimited devices. Um, you know, so it's uh, pretty cool that way. Very good. Uh, now, if our listeners want to get more information about some of the different products that are available from Netgear to protect them, not only during Internet Security Month this month, but also, you know, just to know that they have that peace of mind. Uh, what's the best thing to do? Uh, yeah, so you can just go on to Netgear.com and mm-hmm. uh, get all the information on uh, the Netgear products. Um and as I said, Armor is uh, the our security subscription. It's a subscription service, so it's built onto all these Orbi and Nighthawk. So once you purchase that router, uh, you can you get activated, and you can you get automatically activated, and then you know mm-hmm. you can decide after your trial whether you want to purchase it or not. But uh, yeah, Netgear.com should give you all the information on all our routers and then all our subscription services. Now, for our listeners uh, that uh, have been thinking, uh, you know, maybe Orbi would be the good way to go because they've got different rooms uh, throughout the home that some don't get the best signal, and they may have, they may be able to want to watch, you know, the streaming streaming media on their big television. Um, what, uh, is that easy to set up? Is that something that, you know, somebody listening right now that maybe is not too tech savvy, but likes this idea would like to do this can they uh, implement that pretty easily yeah i mean uh, so our whole setup process is uh, you have a guide which is really simple it's two three steps and it's pretty automatic it's like once you once you uh, you know kind of unbox it and set uh, you know kind of plug it in it's you know there's hardly a couple of steps just in terms of setting up your account and then you're pretty much um, you know good to go um it takes should take you um 5 minutes to really set it up essentially it's a quick onboarding process very good Shalini, thank you so much for coming on Tech Talk Radio, giving us a, a great overview of the products available from Netgear. And again, that's netgear.com. Uh, if our listeners have any questions, they can do that or drop us a line and we'll definitely uh, answer that for them. Thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. And if you've been thinking about using technology to help not only in the house, but how about outside the home, around the yard? New technology from a company called Iragreen. 
We'll find out what that's all about and how it could save you money coming up on Tech Talk Radio. Find us on the web at techtalkradio.com. Now, back to Tech Talk Radio. And welcome back to Tech Talk Radio. Um, You know, it's great when uh, we find smart home technology that helps us in our homes. There's so many different products now. I mean, even our refrigerators can be smart refrigerators. But when it comes to the outside of the home and when it comes to, you know, managing what's going on outside, uh, there are ways to make that even easier and to help be conservative when it comes to our environment. And there is a company out there called uh, Irigreen that actually takes that whole idea and helps using smart technology uh, in developed, they've developed a, a digital smart sprinkler system. And with us on the line is the CEO and co-founder of Irigreen, Shane Dyer. Shane, thanks for coming on Tech Talk Radio. Oh, such a pleasure, Andy. For those of us in Arizona, we know that, you know, the rising water costs have affected many. Uh, there's been a water shortage as well uh, that we know about. Now, while a lot of us may have maybe rocks in our front yard, we use pebble and stone, a lot of us still would like to have a nice garden, and a lot of us can do that. Uh, we have a very luscious garden in our backyard, but of course, being smart when it comes to you know watering them and reducing the cost of water can be done digitally with Irigreen. Tell us a little bit about the, the idea for the company. How, how did you guys start up? Sure. Uh, well, my partner, Gary, is an inkjet printer inventor, oh, and wow. he was just walking along one day and saw all the awful things that happen with sprinklers. You know, everyone's familiar with, you know, water running down your driveway and mm-hmm. into the sidewalk and the amount of waste there. Um, but it turns out that what he saw was a lot of the waste was just in the areas that the sprinkler systems with the mechanical heads overlap. So being an inkjet printer inventor, he looked at this and said, what if we could print the water? So when you get an irrigreen system, instead of having those sort of mechanical sprinkler heads that are all the way around the perimeter of your yard, you get one of these smart heads that sits in the middle and it waters up to about 30 feet and it follows all the contours of your yard, putting down a completely even layer of water, which means you're saving about half the water for the same plant growth that you're looking for. It's just incredible. You know, if you're, you know, in the middle of the summer here, you know, you really want some of these green things around your yard, even if you're in an arid area. But, you know, you don't necessarily want to get that $200, $300 water bill in the middle of the summer. We've got to do something to fix that. So Irrigreen, you know, not only gives you, you know, this smart home extension outside your home to water your home with this sort of, you know, Bellagio fountain that'll pop up (laughs) in your backyard and water your, you know, your green stuff. Right. But it's also really going to help cut into that water bill and, you know, also do this kind of responsible thing for the environment, which means, you know, we still want these green things around us, but we just need to water them in a much more smart way. Now, we have seen technology become easier when it comes to what's inside our home and smart home technology. How about this as far as implementing this? What is What are kind of the steps that our listeners would, would take in getting this uh, all-digital irrigation system from Irrigreen put in? Well, it's pretty amazing because each one of these heads, instead of putting in 10 heads around the perimeter, you're p- replacing that with just one head. So that means there's about 80% less, you know, digging in your yard or anything else like that to put one of these systems in. In fact, we have a majority of our customers actually put it in DIY in their yard. Now, you can always have a landscape contractor come in and put it in for you if that's not the kind of thing you do. But it's, but one of the things that's interesting is it's just a much easier system. In a traditional irrigation system, you not only do you have, you know, like 40 heads around a yard that Irrigreen can do in about five heads, But you also have all those valves and wires, all those irrigation valves, and those are completely gone when you put it in your your green system, one of these digital systems. Oh, wow. So it's a much easier, you know, a lot less labor to put in and just a lot less, you know, kind of muck to manage all over your yard. What I really love about this too, uh, Shane, is when you go to the Irrigreen website, which is irrigreen.com, you can actually put in your address. And what's great about it, you can actually see how your system is laid out. Uh, Maybe get a quote if you want to configure your own system uh, or maybe a pro to come out and do it. But you'll actually get kind of a a Google image visual uh, representation of your home and the surroundings and areas that may need to be taken care of. Yeah, and it even goes further than that. Like if you go to irgreen.com, if you put in your home address, it pulls up that satellite picture. And then you're basically putting little boundary lines around what you want to have watered. 
And then you can drag in these digital heads to basically see how much you know, of the lawn you'll cover and how many of them you'll need. But then the amazing thing is it actually goes back to like three years of historical daily weather data to figure out how much rainfall they are and how much, it, you know, how much water it takes to keep you know, plants or lawn alive. And we'll actually give you an estimate of how many gallons of water you'd save by not using a traditional mechanical irrigation system, instead using a way more efficient digital irrigation system. Oh, wow. And you can just you know, take your water bill, figure out how much you pay for water, and get a real good estimate of how much money you'll save. So this is, you know, this is the first sprinkler system that will literally pay for itself. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, demo, uh, Shane, and what I what I find so amazing is, you know, how many times have I gone out in, in a situation and maybe you've watered a certain area, but unfortunately, maybe you've got a driveway there, or maybe you've got the patio, which of course doesn't need watering. Uh, as this is turning around and spinning around using the smart technology and how you've set it up, it can actually, as it gets to that that uh, that area where you would see it getting covered with water that doesn't need it, it'll actually reduce the consumption and and not spray out the water on that part. So it can be all customized to fit the layout of your home, and it can be adjusted if you do add things, correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it, this is the really, uh, you know, just amazing part in terms of delight, because once you have one of these digital heads, there's an app on your phone where you can basically put out these little dots to make it spray any pattern. So it completely follows that line on your patio or that line on your driveway without getting any water spilling over. It's really accurate. And once it does that, you know, you have a little play button where you can actually watch it trace that entire shape that you created. So it's putting water exactly where you want it and not where you want it. It's really beautiful to see. And that's the other part you mentioned before, which is flexibility. Like we all like to change our lawns, but if you put in a traditional mechanical sprinkler system, as soon as you put in that shed, you've got to dig up and basically do a plumbing project while you move all the heads around and you put new lines in and you put new heads in. If you have an irrigation system, all you do is pick up your app and redraw the shape that you'd like it to water. And it takes you like two minutes and you didn't have to dig anything up. So it gives you so much more flexibility with, to be able to garden and do the things that we love to do in our backyards without having to worry about triggering a big, expensive, dirty plumbing project. Yeah, the other part about too, you know, we're, we're thinking about adding a, a gazebo. So obviously that would change the structure. And with this, we'd be able to kind of coordinate how it's going to go and where it's going to go. Also, Let's face it, uh, Shane, you know, here during the summer months, it can get to be, you know, 115, 120 degrees. Uh, If you miss getting out at that prime time or maybe you have to work and do the watering, uh, you're going to stand out there in the heat. You don't have to do that when this system's installed. Yeah, that's what makes this really good in terms of like a homeowner, especially if you're a busy person, a regular irrigation system, even if you have like a smart controller right? One mm-hmm. that's connected to, you know, to like a uh, weather or soil moisture. The problem with those are that they're just connected to regular valves. So they just sort of turn on those valves and turn them off, but they don't really know how much water's going down or, or, or how efficient that system is. With Irrigreen, we know exactly how much water is printed. So it keeps track of, you know, given the kind of plants that you have, how much water they'll need how much rainfall there is, and also how hot it's been, how windy it's been, so how much water needs to be replaced in that soil. So it's kind of, once you set it up, it's sort of fire and forget. It basically auto-waters and figures out exactly how much water needs to go down and not put it, you know, not put down a drop more. I know there are many listeners right now listening going, this is what we've needed. This is what we want to get. And again, this beats <laughs> that, that traditional, even with that automated system, this really beats that because you can really customize it now say you you wanted to kind of change the flow or change pardon the pun but if you wanted to change maybe a time and whatnot you can do that all via a smartphone or an app that they'd be able to access yeah you have a smartphone app that's really easy to use and not only that you can use it from anywhere in the world so if you're on vacation and you want to check on your system it will show you how much water is being put down and if you want to make changes to it like water on different days or sometimes like you know, your neighborhood will say you can only water a few days. You can set that up to make sure that you're always in compliance. Wow. So it's really, really cool to have a way to feel like you have full control, but also make it easy enough just for a regular consumer. You know, if you can use a remote control for your TV, you can control all this stuff. What is going to be the best way for them to do it? And can you give us kind of an idea? I mean, it's going to vary on each system of what kind of cost they're looking at is kind of implementing Irrigreen? 
Sure, absolutely. So the best way to um, to do it is basically just go to www.eargreen.com. And there's a place in there where if you want to play around yourself, you can put in your address. But there's also a button there if you want to talk to one of the ir- – we have irrigation pros. You can go ahead and set up a little 15-minute call or appointment where they'll basically walk through and for free kind of custom design a system, putting water where you need it. And Perfect. also just talk you through and answer any of your questions. So that's probably the easiest way to go. Uh, systems range anywhere from a little less than 2000 bucks, you know, for small systems to, you know, $3,000 or more for like larger systems in that case as well. Um, but remember that this is also really helping you with saving on those water bills. So in many places that have expensive water, like Southwest or you know, Arizona in particular, um, you know, you see payback periods for these in like three years or four years where you've made your money back. Excellent. So it saves money on that, saves water consumption. So you really, you are helping the environment, especially as we continue to see kind of a water shortage throughout our state. And of course uh, you have control and that's the best thing about it. If you're you know, like me, sometimes I, I'm a little lazy at getting out there and watering and you know, the plants suffer. This is a great way to really have that control and know that they're going to get that. Uh, Irrigreen.com is the website. I R R I G R E E N. Dot com And thank you so much, uh, Shane, for coming on Tech Talk Radio. We appreciate it. Pleasure. And if there's any way we can help out, please let me know, Andy. Really love what you're doing. Stand by. We'll rejoin Slick and Sean. And they say they think they have the product of the week, maybe even of the month or beyond that. That's coming up with Tech Talk Radio. Be sure to check out our blog, blog.techtalkradio.com. And now, back to Tech Talk Radio. This segment, we always leave as a website of the week, a product of the week, a link of the week, an app of the week, something that maybe you could take with you, share with your friends and say, hey, the the guys at Tech Talk Radio, uh, we're talking about, you know, this and it's something I should look at. But we're we're thinking, you know, honestly, you have Diablo 4, which came out, Apple Vision. We talked about that. And we're thinking, okay, maybe Apple Vision really is not only a product of the week, even though we haven't got our hands on it from the demonstration we saw, I think that probably would be kind of our product of the month. <laughs> it's going to be talked about. This could be the product of the year, yeah. It, yeah. it really could be, right? This was the most tight-lipped thing Apple's had recently that hasn't been leaked. But it was incredible, and there was a lot of hype coming around it because everybody knew they were going to announce it. Right. They demoed it to executives and their board and stuff a couple, like two months ago or something. It's going to be cool, and I think we're at the iPhone level revolution again in the terms of ar or what they call xr right it's vr ar mixed reality environments i think we're at that step where apple has made the jump ahead of everybody else again and other people are gonna have to catch up i'm just wondering when are we gonna find the first bonehead that puts it on while they're driving <laughs> or oh i mean you're gonna it's it, we're yeah we're in the age of reaction videos and people doing dumb stuff on the internet right yeah, hundred percent. Somebody's going to be doing that, right? Because how long did it take for somebody to post a video of them in the passenger seat of their Tesla while driving down the freeway, right? Yeah, yeah. Five minutes after they left the parking lot. So of course you're going to see it. Could it not be used for better driving? I mean, we know that the uh, Camaros and some other vehicles have the heads-up display, where uh, basically you have your speed, you have you know your gearing, all of that displayed. Your your fuel can be displayed on the windshield while you're driving down the road. Could this maybe make it a safer experience? I think it's safe to say that this is disclaimer. You should not use this while you're driving. <laughs> there you go. Or flying or doing anything. No, that, no, no. Yeah. I, th- I think, well, if, if you're if you're actually piloting the plane, I think this is going to be incredible for long trips. I, they didn't say specifically you'd be able to do this, right? But could you pair this with AirPods? Ooh. Could you have your AirPods in to listen to the audio? Or does it have to use the spatial audio headphones? Because if... I'm sitting next to somebody and they have a vision on, you know, if I'm sitting next to somebody with my VR headset on, they can hear the audio coming out of my speakers, right? It's not a over the ear enclosed system, right? Right. So can I pair this with my AirPods so that I can listen to it silently? That mm. is a good question. You're right, because it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't cover the ears. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. So, but it's, you know, it's the whole spatial 3D audio thing with the, Six had six speakers designed around the band and all that stuff, right? So if mm. I want to do a silent listening mode or a privacy mode, what does that look like in terms of can I put in earbuds? They showed somebody in the demo 
of them sitting on an airplane, putting it on the vision mode and surrounding themselves with the environment, right? But yeah. what does the audio solution look like that, right? Because if, if I'm playing a movie at full blast because I like listening to my movies loud, is that going to, how, what, how is that going to interact with the environment? Yeah. Some good thoughts. We're going to have to find out more. Maybe uh, next week we'll have an update. Slick, it's great to have you back here with us again. Let's uh, let's do this again. Okay, I'm coming right over. All right. <laughs> have yourselves a great week. I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeird. And I'm Slick. And before we go, one thing we want to mention, the Made It Cast podcast that did an interview with uh, Justin, Sean, and myself is available for you to listen to. You could find the link up on our website at Tech Talk Radio. Dot com. Have a great week. And, and don't be fooled. They actually took a, I sent them a picture of my setup because my camera didn't work. So don't be fooled. My camera was off the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a good picture they used as well, Sean. Uh, as a reminder, too, we're building our YouTube audience and we would love you to connect to us on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Just go to our website at techtalkradio.com. You'll find the links there. In the meantime, we'll be back next week with more of Tech Talk Radio. Take care. <laughs>